Hello and welcome to another episode of the Amazon Unfiltered podcast. Today we're joined by Ann Finch, the commercial director of Agenda Adapt, and I'm super excited to have you on today. Uh, yeah, great to be on. Great to, uh, to to be able to talk through some of these subjects. Perfect. So on our first call, we kind of discussed your backstory and I guess how you found your way in the world of Amazon and what you do today. So maybe you can give our listeners that five minute backstory for some quick context. Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been uh, working with Amazon as a vendor uh, and a seller uh, for over the last kind of 12, 14 years. Um, started back in, in 2010, 2011, uh, and really started to lean into the Amazon ecosystem, uh, ecosystem from a kind of sales perspective, um, mainly vendor focus back then, uh, very kind of small turnover, but it scaled very, very quickly as Amazon does. Um, and, and basically my, my vendor kind of journey then moved into a hybrid journey, uh, where ultimately I was, uh, heading up an in-house global team, uh, that was managing 9,000 ASINs across nine marketplaces, uh, full in-house P&L responsibility. And um, I kind of, uh, I went through all of that without using an agency uh, because I didn't really want to pay anyone to do something that I wasn't able to do myself. Um, it's kind of a long way to go about it, but you do learn quite quickly. Um, so uh, I went through all of that. And then, of course, you you kind of, you understand the value that agencies bring in and, and tech uh, brings to uh, to your day to day roles, um, and then I was approached uh, by the the owner of uh, um, uh, Agenda Adapt to come and go. Actually, look, you now know what a good agency would look like for a vendor. So uh, why don't you come and help us build the Agenda Adapt business, which is what I've been doing for the last year and a half or so. Uh, Agenda Adapt are a full service Amazon agency. We cover all of all of the aspects from Amazon from objectives and, and strategy building all the way through to activation or retail readiness, advertising through sponsored ads and DSP, and then holistic reporting, pulling together the, uh, the retail and the advertising metrics to give you a, a really, I guess, singular view on the Amazon performance. That makes sense. So the topic of today's episode is growth through NPD or new product development. So maybe you can give our listeners some context out, like what you've done with NPD before and how it's helped you guys out. Yeah, sure. So uh, over over the last 10 years or so, I, I really lent on Amazon exclusives uh, to be able to be in control of price and, and uh, the activation of those products on, on Amazon. Uh, and that served me uh, very well. Uh, there was over 350 exclusive ASINs within the catalog, uh, and that covered multiple regions. So that, that wasn't just a, a single uh, exclusive ASIN that went across multiple products. I would have different products for France, Germany, Spain, Italy, USA. Um, and through running those launches, I mean, they were effectively ran like uh, private label contracts. So you would launch them, you'd understand what the annual volume was looking like. Each product would have a a role to play under each of the keywords that they were targeted or the products that they were targeted to go up against. So I, I managed to fine tune that process with my team to make sure that it was it was less of a um, let's load everything and see what happens. It was more of a rifle shot approach where you go, no, I'm going to launch a product. The purpose of this product is to do X and to measure success, it will do Y. Uh, and therefore, we've got a really clear kind of metric of how this product should be performing over a period of time. And, and that's how you should be really looking at product launches on Amazon. And Amazon doesn't really help this situation, by the way, because when you when you first have a conversation with Amazon, particularly on the vendor side, their initial start point is, yeah, just load everything. We want your full catalogue. And they want your full catalogue because they want to understand how you influence their metrics, what your overall profitability is for Amazon. They can't do that if they don't have the full assortment. So Amazon kind of their, their initial start point makes it very difficult to do this um, targeted approach for products. But if you can, having really clear objectives and really a really good purpose for each of the products you're launching, you, they're just a bit more manageable and you'll get more return on that investment because they will be created and designed to be able to deliver a particular KPI for you. All right. So how do you actually come up with product launcher and PD ideas? And how do you brainstorm the initial batch of ideas? Yeah, good, yeah, good, good, good question. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. Um, first one and the most logical one is to look what's already selling in the marketplace so you look at the keywords uh, that are either overperforming or underperforming 
and you look at what consumers are actively clicking on and engaging with and converting on. And you can use Helium 10 or you can use Jungle Scout to be able to do that, to go, OK, this product is ranking at this level. The estimated monthly volume is why. Um, therefore, if I can produce a product that sits alongside that, that may be a similar price, a slightly lower price, or maybe aspirations to have a higher price point, uh, for a more premium quality, um, you, you can then start to go, OK, it's this product I'm going to launch. And actually, success looks like 500 units a week or a thousand units a week, whatever it is. Um, typically, when I was targeting products, I was focused on revenue and profitability. So I would have to make sure every product I reviewed across all of the keywords that I was targeting for for kind of I would call it domination. Um, you know, I would always go for the organic positions one to eight under a keyword as well as the sponsored positions. Um, but if you if you go, look, actually, I want these four products. If I can deliver these four products at this price point at this margin, that's going to deliver me half a million in additional revenue at 20, 30, 40 percent margin, whatever it is. And then it would be a case of sourcing the product back from those those KPIs. If I couldn't source a product at that price, that would then force me to go back and rethink the product because there's absolutely no point in me launching a product that's going to have a negative impact on my profitability or not help me uh, drive my revenue. So it, it was it, it almost was a bit trial and error. But by uh, Jungle Scout for me was always a great tool to be able to use and also Keeper. I mean, these tools have been around for a long time, but they let you understand the volume. But they also let you see the seasonality of products and potentially what the strategies of some of these ASINs are uh, by the sellers or the vendors that are selling them uh, to, to how they're driving the performance. So you can then go, well, if I've got the right product and I've got the right margin, how do I then activate these products to go to top of search? And, and whether that's through high low pricing, it could be everyday low pricing on the product. So you're, you're not really touching it. And then it's overlaying that advertising uh, investment. But it, it's it's always back to and and I see this a lot amongst vendors and sellers. It's not necessarily starting from if I add this product into my assortment, is it going to improve my profitability and my sales? If the answer to those first questions is no, don't launch the product because you're going to spend time and money on it and it's end up, it's just been a waste of money, quite frankly. So so always go, is it going to drive my sales and is it going to be profitable? If the answer is yes, you're, you're, you're kind of halfway there. It's then just a case of can you source it at the right quality, at the right um, size to be able to hit the right price point on on Amazon to drive volume. Now, there are different roles you can have with products as well. It's worthwhile mentioning. So so I would typically operate under a good, better, best under each keyword. So I would go, well, I've got my good product. That's high volume, low margin. I've got my uh, my better product, which is medium volume and slightly better margin. And then I've got my my um, my best product, which is low volume, high margin. Uh, and ultimately, I'd want that good, better, best under each of the keywords I was targeting for domination so that I could then cross sell and trade consumers up or down, depending on what was happening with my sales. So if I needed to drive more margin, guess what? I drive more focus onto the high margin product. If I wanted to get more volume through the doors, uh, I would focus everything on the low volume products and, and dial it up accordingly, accordingly with the uh, price uh, activation and also advertising. It's interesting. I wanted to ask about the um, shotgun versus sniper approach because I know people who just launch like yep. thousands of products every year. Some of them stick, some of them don't. And that's just how they run their business. And it does work sometimes, but it's getting more expensive to do a product launch. So it doesn't work as well now. But like, let's say you brainstorm 50 ideas. You've used Keepa and Helium 10 to find 50 other products in the categories that you operate in that are currently selling well. Um, and that uh, you have a potential supplier for how do you actually narrow those down into launches you're most likely to be successful with? Yeah, so so every product, once you've defined the product range and every, all the commercials stack up, you then have to decide what the role of that product is within the the, uh, the assortment. So is it to go in and be bestseller? Is it to go in and uh, migrate sales away from a, 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 another product within your catalogue? Is it to go in and, and, and take out a competitor race? And what, whatever it is, but you need to have clarity over what the purpose of, of that product is. 
if you're just throwing it on there and you're not really sure what good looks like, um, then of course, yes, it's going to be a bit of a handful to manage and you'll be 50-50 on whether it's been successful. Uh, so have a clear role and objective for the ASIN that you're launching. So like I said, is it uh, taking out competitors? Is it top of search? Uh, is it uh, cannibalization of your own range to improve your overall mix, uh, improving ASP, improving margin, w- whatever it is, but have clarity up front of why you're launching it. So then you've got two variables in the mix. You've got, I've got a product which I know can be profitable and I've now got a reason to launch it. And 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 then you're able to go on to the next part is, okay, how do I, how do I activate this product on Amazon? What's my strategy to be able to deliver the objective that I've defined for this ASIM? Right. I think where a lot of sellers struggle is that part where you say, like, I know it's going to be profitable because a lot of sellers, especially beginner ones or ones that don't really have like outside support or internal teams to help them out, they're not able to predict that. So I guess what does like a good profitable or potentially profitable launch idea look like? Versus an idea that probably won't pan out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it again depends on on the keyword uh, or the search term that you're focusing on. Uh, typically, uh, if you want to hit the sweet spot on Amazon, you want an RRP somewhere between ten to twenty dollars, uh, and you want to be trying to make a kind of forty percent gross margin. If you can do that, actually, you've got enough money or uh, in that product to be able to run some advertising activity on it you'll be able to run a little bit of high low pricing on it as well in the short term and it won't be profitable straight out the door you've got to obviously invest in the product to get it top of search but once you get above the fold in positions one to eight actually you could start to dial back your advertising spend your, your promotional activation investment you can pull that back to um uh, uh, to then see where the product kind of naturally falls on its own. And hopefully by that point, you're already above the fold and you're tracking organically in positions one to eight. But it will all depend on whether you're set up to be able to do that. So, uh, for example, you might have a category where the lead ASIN that's got bestseller position, it's got thousands of reviews and it's, um, I don't know, $7 or, or £7, whatever it is. Um you're probably going to, if you want to take out that product, you're going to have to position that at maybe $6.50 or $6.79. And you might have to have a slightly different pack size variation, slightly different quality uh, to be able to go in and disrupt that bestseller, but you will be able to disrupt it. Um, But you, you have to kind of go into it knowing that, uh, yes, I've I've set it up long term, that it will be profitable for me, but it's only going to be profitable if I can get it to that point. So then you go, okay, so it's a calculated risk. So you can go, how long will it take me to get it from no sales to even, let's say, 50% of the product that I'm targeting? And you might put, and what I would tend to do is I would put a 12-week lead time on that. I would go, okay, if I cannot get this product to a sustainable position and a profitable position within 12 weeks, I'm not going to be able to do it. Because the big unknown of launching products is you don't really know what your competitors are going to do. Um, And if they're strong within the category, they should react. Um, So you, you have to be mindful of that. But if you plan for that and you know that's going to happen and you've got a, a, a kind of a, a deadline in place of when you can go, okay, has this product done what I want it to do? Is it driving my revenue? Is it, is it profitable? Um, you, you're then able to make a good decision and you'll, you'll know whether it's worked or not. And by taking that rifle shot approach, imagine trying to do that over thousands of products. I, I, I mean, it's given me a headache just thinking about it. Um, but if you've got that over one, two, maybe 10 strategic products that have a really clear role and relevancy to in your metrics and your catalogue, it becomes much more much more manageable uh, and you can police it and you can you've only got to go through that process a few times and you go well I know I did this before and that didn't quite work so you either fine tune refine and go again or you go well no that's just not working for me I pull it out but it becomes a, a kind of calculated risk at that point um, that you're able to then accelerate and then as your confidence grows you can launch more products I mean I got up to a point where we were launching 150 products at a time in the early days I mean that was quite a lot um, considering um, where we were 
Um, but that was a uh, that was a full team effort across multiple departments to be able to pull that together. And it was, uh, you know, I feel like I analysed that whole launch within a, an inch of its life, to be honest. But it, it worked to a degree because it, it delivered the revenue and the profitability I wanted. But there were some dead products in that that I eventually went, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll just push that out of the background. But if 80 percent of what you launch delivers what you want it to deliver, I think that's a good position to be in. Of course, of course. Talk more about forecasting. So how do you forecast budgets? Like how do you tie back the numbers that you see with your competitors? And I guess what you've got so far to how much you're going to have to spend to achieve your objectives, what the actual timelines look like, what amount of profit you can expect and so on. Yeah, so so I think with product launches, you can um, you, first of all you need to forecast your volume requirements. Most factories, if, if you've got your own factory or if you're sourcing it from from elsewhere, they'll be volume dependent. So if you've got your own factory, you might have a minimum run of ten thousand units, for example. So you, you always have these things to consider whenever you're launching products. So from in, in my world, that was a minimum production run of of five, maybe ten thousand units. So I know. That if I'm launching a product, I've got to make sure I can sell that stock. Um, otherwise, I've got an overstock situation, and uh, having an overstock situation is probably worse than uh, uh, than, uh, than than going out of stock. Um, maybe. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's it's first of all looking at that stock requirement. So I I would always work on that three month um, or twelve week window. So depending on your replen dates from your warehouse and or from the factory to be able to get the stock back in, you always need to work back from that because you need to know when to reorder. If you are launching a product and the objective of that product is a me too ASIN, maybe with some added value, maybe with a, with better quality, but it's to go in and take out the top competitor within that particular keyword. And you can see that their annualized volume is, let's call it, 10,000 units or, or 20,000 units, 30,000, whatever it is. Success on that product, ultimately, yes, would be I want 100% of that volume. But realistically, you're probably going to get maximum 50% of that volume. So you go, OK, so if they're doing 1,000 units a month, I want to be doing 500 units a month. And my target is to make sure I get to that position by the end of those 12 weeks as a minimum. Uh, and again, this is about putting your own internal objectives in line so that if anyone asks you at any particular time you can go well how what does good look like on that ASIC well it's 500 units a week because that's 50 percent of the top sellers volume so you you start from that and then you go okay well if that's 500 a week uh and my minimum order value is um your volume is 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 5,000 units you go 500 times 12 work that out on my calculator that's 6,000 units so you go then there's no problem if I can scale up to that. Now, the chances of you being at 50% growth, 50% uh, of the volume straight out of the door is very unlikely. You probably need a month to be able to ramp up to that. And that's where you start to deploy your, your content. You've got your, your advertising and your promotions. So I'll, I'll quickly give you a bit of an overview on what that would look like from a launch plan across the 12 weeks. So typically you would launch the product in, in month one. Um, I would let it run for a couple of weeks to find its organic positioning on on the, uh, the the search terms, whether it's page two or page three, just to see where it naturally lands. But you'd make sure your content, everything is all up to date and your SEO, every, everything's all in play, brand story, A+, plus, et cetera. Um, and then what you would do is start to high-low price it. So you would drop the price by maybe 10%, 15%, 20%. You would play around with the discounts. You would probably go a bit deeper to start with, so maybe 20%. And you would run that for a week. You would let it come off promotion. Then you'd see what that did to the bestseller rank and the positioning within the uh, the keyword. By that point, because you're engaging in the product, and that's probably by the end of month one, you should be probably at the bottom of page one you, you should be on that page at, at that point if you're starting to activate it and and you're looking for those daily sales depend and these will differ by category but for me within the categories i was servicing i was always going look if i could start to sell 20 a day to then go to 30 a day and then jump up to 50 a day that for me is where i really need to be for the product to kind of hold its own 
uh, above the fold on 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 the front of uh, or the top of page one. Um, so you run your promotions, you, you see where it settles, and you understand and after the first month that performance, and then you can start to dial up your advertising. So you might do that towards the back end of month one, but you would go probably full out on sponsored products. Um, we normally kind of recommend to split it across sponsored brand and, and uh, sponsored brand video, et cetera, and some sponsored display. But you would probably go all out on sponsored products to give you that initial boost on, on the sales and, and the visibility. Um, but you would you would apply the budget based on if you're going to sell that stock out in 12 weeks in 12 weeks and the value of that stock is 100 grand, let's say, whatever the value is. Um, I would take 10% of that total value over the 12 weeks. And that's the pot of money that I would use to advertise that product. So you go, I would be investing in the product before I had any revenue back because I wanted to get it to that top level as quickly as possible. That doesn't always work because if you do that of a product that just doesn't um, get traction in the algorithm, you've wasted a load of money. But by taking that rifle shot approach and having that clear objective and purpose for the product, you're already launching with kind of 50, 60, 70% confidence that this product is going to nail that position. So to then make that additional bet on, well, I'm going to spend £10,000 to be able to sell this stock through. And if I deliver it, I get 100k upside in additional sales. That's what you need to be able to do. But you, you need to run your price promotions. You need to then layer on your advertising spend, be really aggressive on the lower funnel and keep measuring that daily sales performance. Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 40? Is it 50? What's your position on page one? Is it going up? Is it going down? If you're spending more and your product is not moving in position, why? What's happening around it? What are the competitors doing? What's the reviews coming back on these products? When you're a vendor you can and seller, you can go through Vine and you can get various um, reviews on your product. Typically, if I had a product which was similar to another product within my range uh, that was already doing very well, I would link it as a variation and I would piggyback on the back of that product. So you, you get some of that natural momentum and traffic there. Um, but at certain points, I would then want to pull it out to see what the position was on the category uh, or in the uh, under the keyword. So um, figure out what your budget is that you want to spend and think about the long term revenue investment that it's going to deliver back into your business uh, and the profitability. Um, make sure that you put some money aside to be able to high low the product pricing, uh, but test the depth of discount. Um, Amazon tend to ask for 30, 40 percent discount, but actually the biting point on volume on some products might be 10 percent. So you might not need to be very aggressive. It depends what happens in the wider market and what competitors are doing. But by laying on those elements, you're you're fueling the, the potential success for this product because you've, you've got the right product. You've got the right price point. You're giving it an opportunity to get the visibility. You're trying to drive conversion by showing consumers you've got great price. If you do those things consistently over the 12 weeks, the chances are you will be above the fold page one um, positions one to eight because you're, you're activating and you're, you're energizing in the product. Imagine that if you did nothing and just I'm just going to launch a product and see what it did. You're hoping. And, and one thing I've learned over many years of working with Amazon, if you hope that something's going to happen, you, it, it, it isn't. It will not happen. So you've really got to go for it and be confident in 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 the process that you've deployed and i think it's all things on amazon really if you plan what should happen and you you build the scenarios of what good looks like what bad looks like you can be pretty confident with most things that you're launching that makes sense that makes sense so what does that ppc launch strategy look like in terms of like actual specifics and i guess how does that change when you switch between the objectives for each launch that you mentioned earlier yeah, so so initially it's um, uh, I mean standard PPC. You would you build your auto campaigns, or you'd harvest any data you've got from similar products within the keywords. So you'd you'd use the Amazon algorithm to farm those keywords for for a couple of weeks. 
you would then start to take out the negative keywords and push those uh, push those away, and then you'd oversteer on your manual campaigns on the uh, on the keywords that were giving you the highest visibility and, and the best performance. Um, I, during launch for those 12 weeks, I would focus on sponsored products. It's all very lower funnel, but you, you've got to get there very quickly um, so that you can then move on to the next product development. Uh, with PPC um, management, those optimizations on those new products, that's almost going to be a daily role of going in, what's working, what's not, what's happening with the budget. If we've got the right level of budget, do we need to increase it? Do we need to decrease it? Um, and making sure that you're really stay, uh, p- paying close attention to what's happening on those products um, and, and be ready to test and learn. So you might find actually there's an opportunity to launch into a, um, into a new format. It could be a sponsored brand video. It could be launching sponsored brand. Um, be ready to test and learn if any of those add more value. But a lot of that will depend on what happens in and around the category when you go in and you try and disrupt it. Uh, And I see it a lot in multiple categories where you've got established brands and then someone's coming in and they've just completely disrupted it by coming in at half price. Uh, They're throwing loads of money at advertising, whether it's videos, whether it's sponsored products. And you look at it and go, that's not profitable long term there's absolutely no way so they're deploying that exact same strategy but they will have done it on scale but but it isn't profitable so so again it's back to that measured approach but recognize when when that strategy is being played against you so that you can then compete against it uh and dial up your spend dial up your advertising but it's in in an ideal world you you want to go heavy on the investment in weeks four to eight and then start to reduce the investment once you're seeing that visibility and and then by the end of that 12th week that's when you go okay if i take my hands off the wheel of this product now is it going to be okay if it's okay move on and you can focus on the next round of mpd that makes sense so i guess what framework or what logic do you use to decide whether it's time to launch new products right now or if it's maybe time to just focus on what you already have in your catalog uh, a lot of that will come down to the retail metrics. Uh, so I would always look at glance views or, or page views on products. On the vendor side, I'd be looking at net PPM, ASP, uh, any gaps in keywords, any emerging competitors, uh, reviews on products. So I would, I would look to get that holistic view. Um, let's say, for example, Amazon was challenging me on my average selling price uh, within the market. Uh, Have I got products that can influence the ASP to be able to improve the overall ASP for for Amazon and therefore improve their net PPM or haven't I? Um, It might be that I've got a margin challenge. It could be that I've been selling a product where all of a sudden my cost has gone up 20 percent, but I haven't passed the price increase through to Amazon. And therefore, my margin is now suffering, even though my sales are still very good. So um, I think a lot of it will be. um, what what's happening with your business at that moment in time what's happening with your brand at that moment in time can the current assortment deliver where you want to go and if it can't okay well this is where we try and fill the gaps the um the great thing about amazon and i've worked with with big retailers in the uk and across europe and uh, with amazon there's no kind of seasonal range change or launch plan you can launch products as you see fit and that for me is one of the most exciting parts about amazon is because you can go i now want to launch a product or i want to launch 10 products or 20 products or 50 products whatever it is um, but i want to launch them uh, in the next four months Uh, whereas if you work with some of the bigger retailers it might be well we only do our range changes uh, twice a year for spring summer or autumn winter Um, so I think this kind of this notion or or that brands bring in that well we do our MPD process once a year I that's too slow yeah it's too slow yeah the Amazon think how much Amazon changes in a month you know, to wait a year before you launch a product just sounds mad. So so actually, I think that's a great challenge for brands and manufacturers to go, actually, let's just let's turn it on its head. If we could launch products at the frequency that we wanted to 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 help us deliver our goals on Amazon, what does that look like? And typically, I would say that's probably quarterly. I, I think that's a core ongoing. I mean, I, my my team that I was managing on the on on the vendor side. 
NPD was something that I expected them to come and talk to me about weekly. You know, what new products could we look at that are going to help us deliver our objective? Which new products will help us be a stronger brand and improve our overall profitability uh, on, on Amazon? Uh, what does it look like? What's the commercial opportunity? Um, so so it, it becomes part of the language, like we talk about PPC, like, like we talk about advertising, like we talk about um, uh, any of the KPIs. How do we measure our success on our ability to react or be proactive on, on new product development? Amazon blows that wide open. And, and that for me is brilliant because you, you're then in control of, of, of how fast you want to run. Um, and and that's, a, that's a great place to be in. Of course. Well, I have an interesting question for you. Um, I wanted to ask okay. what's something that I didn't ask you about NPD that I maybe should have. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm asking like if, if you could come up with a question that you think is important out NPD that I didn't ask already, what would that be? And what would the answer, I guess? For oh, that be? Uh, okay. So a question that's important for NPD. It, when considering the role of new products, it's, it's do try and understand the... Um, the impact it will have on your catalog. So the risk is when when you're launching MPD, it's very easy to do Me Too products, but ultimately when you do a Me Too product, you're you're potentially cannibalizing your your product range. And and that has a knock-on impact through your business. So if you cannibalize an existing product, for example, and you migrate volume from one ace into another, You've then got to recheck your forecast. You've got to recheck all of your budgets. You've got a lot of things downstream that will then be impacted by that. What is a, a, a good intention to be able to launch the ASIM? Uh, but cannibalization is 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 a is a big is a big element of, of Amazon, particularly when you're doing me to ASIM. So I would say that that's the bit to watch out for. And that's probably the question that when you're presenting new products to marketing teams or to, to other internal stakeholders, they'll go, yeah, but we've already got a product that does that. And you, you go, OK, what, but this one's got X, Y, Z or it's doing this or hitting a different price point or it's got a different design or, or, or whatever it is. Um, but cannibalization is, is a big thing. So sometimes you can buy design, go. I know I want to cannibalize my existing range because I want to reduce the reliance I've got on one ASIN or two ASINs or however many. Uh, or you might be going, uh, yeah, I hadn't even considered that consumers would stop buying that one and they're going to buy that one. Uh, and so then you need to check. And ultimately, you might be OK with cannibalization, but you're, um, it, there's no point in cannibalizing your own range if you're going to make less sales and less profit. So it's probably the the bit where it, it tends to come unstuck in the uh, in the background if you haven't done that check. Yeah, I think this was called the um, barbarians at the gate principle, something like that, where there's this story where a bunch of people are in this fortress and they have like animals that they worship, and then they're surrounded by this other army around them from the outside, and they can't get food or water yep. anymore. So they have two options: either kill two or three of those animals and eat them so that they can survive and fight back or they do nothing and they die of starvation and the other guy just comes in and yeah, yeah. kills all of them so sometimes you kind of have to be your own competitor so you can stay relevant yes yes but yeah um, Absolutely. thank you so much for sharing that uh, maybe you can tell our audience where they can find out more about you yeah, sure. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Finch. Um, I tend to post various bits on there talking about uh, some, some tips and tricks around uh, Bender Central and how to maximize your performance on Amazon. Um, feel free to, to direct message me if, if you want to have a quick catch up. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me.